Hello. 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 Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is 18.30 South African time on Wednesday, the 19th of October, 2022. Welcome to Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring course. Today is lecture five. In fact, today is lecture six. We are almost at the conclusion of the course. This evening, we shall be taking you through the modes of dismissal, laws 32 until law 40. I will be going through from 32 until 37. My co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, will take us through laws 38, 39 and 40. You will notice that we are not going to go through laws 41 and 42. Law 41 is unfair play and law 42 is player conduct. Those two laws are governed very differently from one association to the next and the playing conditions are prevalent in those two laws and we will cover them in level two and level three for the purposes of the level one umpiring course we shall not be covering them. However, they are in our presentation, which I have sent out uh, numerous times along with other course material. So you are welcome to go through that on your own. What we will go through after Law 40, Abdullah will take us through a match preparation presentation, which is critical for you to get on the park to add to your law knowledge. OK, um, all the way through this course, we have been given you on field techniques and this last presentation will get you ready in terms of your appearance, your preparation and your equipment that you require to be on the field for the first time. If you haven't umpired before, or if you have umpired before, this will hopefully add a bit of professionalism to your umpiring. Lastly, before I get into the laws, please, everybody, remember to keep your microphone on mute and to save yourself and other candidates' bandwidth. Uh, we would also request that you switch off your camera. Uh, as usual, there will be a chance for a question and answer session at the end of the lecture where you will be asked to unmute your microphone to address the floor. The first mode of dismissal is also the most important, or let's call it the boss of all modes of dismissal, bold. When is a batter out bold? The striker is out bold according to law if his or her wicket is put down by a ball delivered by the bowler not being a no ball, even if it first touches the striker's bat or person. However, the striker shall not be out bold if before striking the wicket the ball has been in contact with any other player or an umpire. Okay, so the ball has to go. Uh, from the bowler's hand uh, to the wickets. It can go via the striker, bat or person, but not via any other person on the field. 
Why did I say that bold is the boss of all dismissals? The Lord tells us that the striker is out bold if his wicket is put down as in 32.1 above, even though a decision against him or her for any other method of dismissal would be justified. What does that mean? Let me explain it to you via the use of an example. Imagine a bowler bowls right arm over the wicket, um, medium pace bowler, and the delivery is a fair delivery, so not a no ball. And the ball goes towards the striker and it hits the striker's front pad uh, halfway up the pad in front of middle stump and the umpire in his position thinks the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and in fact the ball does go on after ricocheting or slightly brushing the front pad it goes on to hit the off stump and the bells are removed so what the law is saying in 32.2 is that even though all the conditions for a leg before wicket dismissal were met and the ball hit the pad before going on to hit the wicket. So uh, technically the LBW happened before the bold. The law says that even though the LBW happened before the bold, bold takes precedence over all other dismissals so the striker will be out bold not leg before wicket so it's important for the umpire to uh, wait and see what happens in a delivery before making a decision because if it is bold we learned yesterday from Abdullah that no appeal is required for bold and so the batter would be out bold and would walk off. Next law is court. Let's see what the law says about this mode of dismissal. We've got a video to take us through. Fair catch. A catch shall be considered fair if the ball is held in a fielder's hand hugged to the body of the catcher or accidentally lodges in his or her clothing, helmet or protective equipment. But of course, this being cricket, it isn't always that simple. If a fielder deliberately uses an item of clothing to try to catch the ball, it is not out and five penalty runs are awarded to the batting side. However, the ball can be caught after it has deflected off the other batsman, an umpire, another fielder, including off a helmet being worn, or even if it lodges in a fielder's helmet. Perhaps the main criterion for a catch to be considered fair is that the ball must not touch the ground before being caught. Here, for example, the ball does not touch the ground even though the hand holding it does so in affecting the catch. This is a fair catch. And then there is the question of catches near the boundary. This is such an interesting subject that we've given it a film all of its own. To catch up on everything to do with catching, simply refer to Law 33 in the Blue Book. How many runs are scored when a batter is out caught? The answer is nil. The law says that if the striker is dismissed caught, runs from that delivery completed by the batter before the completion of the catch shall not be scored, but any runs for penalties awarded to either side shall stand. Remember I mentioned that bold is the big boss of all modes of dismissal. Court is the little boss of modes of dismissal. Why do I say that? The law says that 
if the criteria of 33.1 are met and the striker is not out bold, then he or she is out court, even though a decision against either better for another mode method of dismissal would be justified. OK, so what the law is saying here is if a better is not out bold. And there are other options in terms of modes of dismissal and one of them is court, then the striker will be out court. Let me give you an example to illustrate this point. Bowler balls a fair delivery. Batter hits the ball straight back at the bowler in the air. Bowler sticks out his hand to try and catch the ball. The ball touches the bowler's fingers. Uh, but is not caught while still in the air the ball goes on to hit the non-strikers stumps and the non-striker is backing up outside of his crease therefore the conditions are met for the non-striker to be out run out however the ball deflects off the non-striker stumps and still in the air flies to mid off who completes the catch. So the law says here that even though the run out occurred before the catch, catch shall take precedence and the striker will be out caught instead of the non striker being out run out. OK, very important that it does not matter the order of events if Bold is not involved, but court is involved with any other mode of dismissal, then court will take precedence and the striker will be out court instead of, in my example, the non striker being out run out. OK. If bold and court are not involved and you have more than one mode of dismissal in a delivery, then you decide on which happened first, OK? But if bold is not involved and court is involved with another mode of delivery, then court will take precedence. Next mode of dismissal is hit the ball twice. Let's look what the law has to say about hitting the ball twice. And we've got another animation video to help us through it. Hit the ball twice. Hit the ball twice and you're out. Unless, of course, you're defending your wicket or it was accidental, in which case you're still in. The striker is out hit the ball twice if, while the ball is in play, it strikes any part of his person or is struck by his bat and, before the ball has been touched by a fielder, he willfully strikes it again with his bat or person. The key word here is willfully. But if this had happened instead, the batsman would remain in. In other words, inadvertent double strikes don't count. The batsman is allowed to hit the ball a second time in order to guard his wicket. He can use his bat or almost any part of his body. He cannot, however, use a hand that's not holding the bat. The only time you can't use your bat to hit the ball twice to defend your wicket is when it would prevent a catch. The batsman can also hit the ball a second time in order to return it to a fielder, as long as a fielder has given him permission to do so. If you'd like to swat up on this a bit more, simply turn to Law 34 in the Blue Book, where you'll find all the nitty-gritty detail you need. Are there any runs allowed when the ball is lawfully struck twice? Let's see what the law says. When the ball is lawfully struck more than once, as permitted in 34.3, if the ball does not become dead for any reason, the umpire shall call and signal dead ball 
as soon as the ball reaches the boundary or at the completion of the first run. The umpire shall delay the call of dead ball to allow the opportunity for a catch or a run out to be completed. OK, so. In a nutshell, no runs are allowed when a. Ball is lawfully struck uh, more than once. And the umpires shall wait until the first run has been completed by the batters if they attempt to run before calling and signaling dead ball and returning the batters to their original ends. This is the procedure. And quite importantly, the reason that we allow the batters to run and only call dead ball when the first run has been completed is to allow the fielding side the opportunity to run out the batters. Um, what sometimes often happens is that uh, the fielding side doesn't know this law and the batters maybe also don't know this law and somebody screams in the field, he hit the ball twice, he can't run, he hit the ball twice, he can't run. So if there is that chaos that, that occurs and the batters aren't sure whether to run or not and are stranded uh, mid-pitch, I think the easiest solution for umpires is just to call and signal dead ball even before um, the run has been completed uh, because it could be that they would have had time to complete the run, but they just didn't know whether they could run or not. Um, so I, in situations like that, usually just call and signal dead ball. Uh, similar to when no shot was offered and the ball hit a batter's pad and they uh, think about running, they and then a fielder shouts, they can't run, they can't run, and then they stop running. Um, I think the easiest just to bring some calm and control over the situation is to call and signal dead ball, even though that is not really what the law directs us to do. Um, just for some calm and control is to call and signal dead ball uh, to end all the chaos. We will allow any five penalty runs to be awarded, except if the ball goes on and hits the helmet behind the wicketkeeper, uh, that the fielding side will not be penalized if a striker had lawfully hit the ball twice and the ball ends up hitting the helmet behind the wicketkeeper. OK, so any other offense uh, that is punishable by five penalty runs would stand, but uh, not 28.3. Law 35 is hit wicket. And here we're going to have a decision for you all to make. So pay careful attention to the law and we will ask you to apply it in a live scenario at the end of the law. How can a striker be out hit wicket? The striker is out hit wicket if after the bowler has entered the delivery stride. OK, so that's after the bowler has landed on his or her back foot. And while the ball is in play, the striker's wicket is put down by either the striker's bat or person. But it has to be in any of these circumstances. One, in the course of any action taken by the striker in preparing to receive or in receiving a delivery. Two, in setting off for the first run immediately after playing or playing at the ball. And the important word here is immediately. So quite often what happens when a batter plays a shot 
is and it goes directly towards a fielder. The first call, if the coaching is any good, the first call by a batter will be wait. And if there is a fumble or a misfield, then only will the batters run. So if after having waited and then after the misfield, the batters decide to run and the striker slips and trods on his or her wicket in taking off for the first run, but it wasn't immediately after hitting the ball because there was a call of weight and they waited for the misfield before they took off. Then we shall see on the next slide that the striker would be not out hit wicket. Why? Because he did not take off immediately after hitting the ball. Okay, so the important word there is immediately. Third instance is if no attempt is made to play the ball, again, in setting off for the first run, provided that in the opinion of the umpire, the striker set off immediately after the opportunity of playing the ball. Lastly, in lawfully making a second or further stroke to guard his or her wicket, if the striker puts the wicket down, so imagine that the ball is rolling towards the stumps and the striker tries to hit the ball away from the stumps, but in doing so actually hits the stumps, then the striker will be out hit wicket. So we've covered how and when a striker will be out hit wicket. Let us look at the scenarios where the striker will be not out hit wicket. Uh, I beg your pardon, we're still on out hit wicket. If the striker puts his or her wicket down in any of the ways described in the previous slides, before the bowler has entered the delivery stride, um, what shall we do? Remember I mentioned that the delivery stride starts when the back foot of the bowler lands. Um, so if the striker puts his or her wicket down before the bowler enters his or her delivery stride, either umpire shall call and signal dead ball. And of course, we learned last week that anything that happens after the umpire has called dead ball is irrelevant. OK, so let's look at the scenarios when a striker will be not out hit wicket. Striker will be not out hit wicket. In any of the ways referred to 35.1, if it occurs after the striker has completed any action in receiving the delivery. OK, so this is going to be the judgment call we have to make on our out or not out decision is has the striker completed receiving the delivery or not? If you feel that the striker has completed receiving the delivery then and then uh, put down his wicket, then you would give it not out. If you feel that the striker has not completed receiving the delivery and then put down his wicket, then you shall give him out. OK, so judgment call. It is an opinion law. If the hit wicket occurs when the striker is in the act of running, but not setting off immediately for the first run, then the striker will be not out hit wicket. 
if the striker puts down his or her wicket when the striker is trying to avoid being run out or stumped, then the striker will be not out, hit wicket. Okay, so imagine a striker is facing a spin bowler. Spin bowler bowls, the striker comes down the wicket, double step to try and meet the ball on the half volley or on the full, uh, misses the ball and trying to avoid being stumped, runs back towards his or her own stumps and is running so fast, cannot stop him or herself and runs into the stumps. That will be not out hit wicket. Okay. If the striker is trying to avoid a throw at any point in time and puts down his or her wicket, the striker will be not out hit wicket. If the bowler after entering the delivery strike does not deliver the ball and the striker still puts down his or her wicket, the striker will not be out hit wicket. Why? Because the ball was not delivered. Okay, remember that the dismissal of hit wicket does count in favor of a bowler. So the ball must be delivered for the hit wicket dismissal to be achieved. And for that reason, if the bowler bowls a no ball, then a striker cannot be out hit wicket. Okay. So let's have a look at a hit wicket appeal. And I'm only going to play it up until the um, second or third replay. I will not show the decision being made by the television umpire. Uh, I will uh, give you all a second chance to have a look at um, the dismissal or the appeal. And you should please give your answer to the appeal in the chat box, either out hit wicket or not out hit wicket. Uh, please all get involved, watch first and then make your decision. Ball. Yeah, that's what can happen when you sit and you think the pitch is behaving very nicely. End of the over. Now, what has happened here? Well, has he uh, has he uh, somehow touched the stumps? Uh, what's what's going on here? One yeah, of the Brendan bills... Taylor, I think, after he's played the shot, has knocked the bales off with his bat. I didn't see what was happening. I just heard it in my ear. And uh, Shakib al Hassan has gone and uh, appealed to Maria Rasmus. So, discussion going on between those two men. Be interesting to see what happened here, actually. Well, he's just uh, checking with the uh, fielders. And we're not too sure, but the bales were off. One of the bail. Let's see what has happened. He's fine. It's a legal delivery. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing. 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 What does he do? Oops. That's gone. That's gone. He cannot believe his luck. I thought it's going to be his lucky day today. Unlucky second time around. I'm just going to play that last bit again to you guys for you to make a decision. It'll be a big blow if uh, Brendan Taylor de departs in that fashion. Nothing, nothing, nothing. What does he do? Oops, that's gone. That's gone. He cannot believe his luck. I thought it's going to be his lucky day today. Please make your decision in the chat box. 
out hit wicket or not out hit wicket. And please do not let the commentator fool you into your decision. Remember, you must make your own decision without fear or favor, according to the laws of cricket. Moving on to one of the shortest laws in the law book, but always the most contentious decision on any Saturday, leg before wicket. Once again, we've got a animation video for you to have a look. Leg before wicket, LBW. Ah! LBW is a little like the offside rule in football. Many people claim to know it, but how many people really do? Our handy checklist means that whether you find yourself umpiring an international test match or the kids on the beach, your reputation for fairness will remain intact. There are five basic criteria to consider. The batsman is out, leg before wicket, if one, the bowler bowls a ball that isn't a no ball, unlike this poor fellow, two, the ball, if it is not intercepted on the full, pitches in line between wicket and wicket or on the offside of the batsman's wicket. It cannot be out if the ball pitches outside the line of the leg stump. Three, the ball hits the batsman either full pitch or after pitching and before he hits it with his bat. Four. Ah, this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If the batsman was making a genuine attempt to play the ball, the point of impact must be between wicket and wicket for LBW to be an option. However, if the batsman has made no genuine attempt to play the ball, the contact must either be between wicket and wicket or outside the line of the off stump. Five, this is the crucial part. But for the interception by the batsman, the ball would have gone on to hit the stumps and dislodge the bales. Any questions? Just refer to Law 36 in the Blue Book. Right, so just to go over those points, and this you need to decide in a matter of seconds in your head and with experience you will get better at going through the leg before wicket checklist and you shall become more consistent in your application of the opinion law the only opinion really is as to the last point would the ball apart from the interception by the striker's person, would the ball have gone on to hit the wicket? Um, all the other items are factual. You see them happen, and it is up to you to decide where the ball is pitched, where the ball has hit the person of the striker was it in line or was it outside the off stump and so what's important for leg before wicket decisions is that you should give each appeal due consideration so what looks very plumb and in front of the feel like you want to give it out immediately as soon as the bowler goes up you go up with him but that is not a good idea why because sound travels slower than light and quite often as umpires we use our hearing more than what we see because the naked eye struggles to see faint inside edges and of course, we know that a leg before wicket should not be considered if the ball has hit the bat before it hits the pad. 
right? So quite often what happens with the inside edge LBW decisions is that you only recognize the fact that there was an inside edge via the sound. We call it tick doof. So the tick is the edge of the bat being hit by the ball and then the doof is the ball thudding into the pad. So you need to recognize the tick boof or sometimes you have pad first, so you have a boof tick. Pad first, you can give out brave decision, but correct if you are a hundred percent sure. So all of these things you need to consider for every single leg before wicket decision. Has the ball pitched in line or has it pitched outside leg? If it's pitched outside leg, then immediately not out. Has it hit in line or has it hit outside the off stump? If it's hit outside the off stump, then the striker should not be playing a shot for you to consider the LBW decision. I recommend taking between two and three seconds to give the striker out or not out. So whatever your decision, make sure you take the same amount of time to make the decision because if you make it too quickly, uh, whether it's out or not out, the aggrieved party will think that you have not given the decision the due consideration that it deserves. Okay, and you will find out through experience that those inside edges, you only really hear when you replay the delivery both sight and sound in your head before making your decision. So don't be rushed and also don't be fooled by the strength of the appeal. A lot of bowlers and a lot of wicket keepers will go up hard and shouting and screaming, sometimes even celebrating, running through without looking back at you. That is to fool you into believing that it is an easy out decision. Um, whether they heard the inside edge or not, they will celebrate if it's plumb in front, if it looks straight in front, okay? But you should not be fooled by that. You need to take your time, consider all five or six checkbox items before giving your decision out or not out. And body language is very important when you give out or not out, especially on leg before wicket decisions. Okay, I hope that piece of advice you will take one for your umpiring careers because umpires are made and derated mainly based on their decision making for leg before wicket decisions. So let's go through a few visual examples of leg before wicket appeals. Here we have a right hand batter and we should all know that this ball, as you can see, has pitched well outside the leg stump. So whatever happens from here on in, we should not consider the LBW appeal as being out. We shall consider it not out. Okay, why? Because it's pitched outside leg. So this is probably a left arm over the wicket bowler or a right arm round the wicket bowler. Uh, the ball has pitched probably a stump and a half or two stumps outside leg stump, so that can or should not be given out leg before wicket. Here we have a ball pitching in line, hitting in line below the knee roll. I'm quite happy to give that out. Okay, even though a shot was played, that is irrelevant because the impact is in line. So this batter is a candidate to be given out leg before wicket. You just need to decide with leg before wicket being an opinion law, is the ball going on to hit the stumps if it wasn't for the interception of the pad? I would say yes. What about this one? Impact, uh, sorry, pitched outside off. That's fine. Impact outside off. Is that fine? 
No, it is not fine. Why? Because the striker is playing a shot. Uh, a bowler will argue with you to say that the bat is hidden behind the pad, uh, but no. If that ball it were a little bit higher, then it would hit the bat. So I'm quite happy to tell the bowler that a shot is being played. So impact outside off is not to be considered a candidate for leg before wicket. Okay, should not be out. This is an interesting one. Ball is pitched outside off. The impact is also, uh, however, the batter is shouldering arms, so you can consider giving this batter out. What you obviously need to consider is the last tick box item on the leg before wicket checklist is would the ball have gone on to hit the stumps if it wasn't for the interception of the pad? Uh, I would say the ball is coming back slightly, but not enough to hit the off stump. So even though he is a candidate, I would say not out for this particular delivery. Um, I think this is the similar to the first one, pitched in line, hit in line, below the knee roll. Happy to give that out. If you get uh, those as LBW appeals on a Saturday, you are quite happy because that is a straightforward decision. Now, what about this one? Left arm over the wicket again. Mitchell Stark pitched in line, hit in line. I would say it's pitched on leg stump and it's hit on off stump. So we have ticked the first four boxes. What is the last box that we need to tick? If it were not for the interception of the pad, would the ball have gone on to hit the stumps? If you look at how far forward the uh, striker is, he is about, I would say, a meter, maybe 1.2 meters outside of the popping crease. From the popping crease to the stumps is another 1.22 meters. So the ball still has to travel 2.4 meters at least, say two and a half meters before it reaches the stumps. I would say the angle of this delivery will end up outside the off stump. So not out. What does a left hand over the wicket bowler need to do to get an LBW decision against a right hand batter. The ball needs to pitch in line and then straighten or swing in the air, pitch in line and hit in line and go on to hit the stumps. It does not look like there is any uh, seam movement that is helping this left arm seamer. So definitely pitching in line, impact in line, but missing off stump. What about this one? This would probably be a right arm off spinner. Pitching well outside off stump, impact on middle stump. So again, batter has got a little bit of a stride in, about a meter outside the popping crease. So the ball has got 2.2 meters still to travel before it gets to the stumps. This on the angle is definitely missing leg stump. So not out LBW. Here we have a delivery pitching outside off impact on off stump. So I think the line of this delivery is fine. It would go on towards middle and off stump, maybe middle stump. But what about the height? It has hit the striker 
well above the roll. And on the flap, on the top of the flap. And if you look at most uh, strikers, let's go back to see if we can see the height of the striker in relation to the stumps. And this is a good idea for you when you are at striker's end to see uh, the top of a batter's pads. Where are they in relation to the height of the stumps? So this striker, the top of his pads are basically uh, stump height. So if we go back to our decision that we need to make, the ball is already at stump height on impact. It still has 2.2, maybe 2.5 meters to travel, definitely going over the stumps. So not out LBW. OK. Um, one last tip is the height of a leg before wicket decision. Um, is better seen by the strikers and umpire who is at square leg or maybe at point. So what Abdullah and I do is we signal to each other if I am at square leg and I think that a delivery is going over the stumps, I will signal in a motion of my hands going up and down, up and down. And Abdullah will not turn his head to look at me. He will merely direct his eyes towards me and he will see me gesturing that I think the ball is going over the stumps and he will give the decision not out for height. Uh, that comes with a lot of experience and a lot of trust with your partner. Uh, you need to obviously discuss it uh, before the match and you need to also uh, be happy with all the other conditions having been met. And then the last one is if it were not for the interception of the pad, would the ball have gone on to hit the stumps? You are happy with the line, but you're not so sure about the height then you have a quick glance at your partner. If your partner is not signaling anything, then that probably means he or she doesn't know or you haven't spoken about helping each other out on the height of leg before wicket decisions. So uh, then you're on your own and you need to decide from what you have seen whether the ball is going over the stumps or not. Um, quite often you don't see exactly where on the pad the ball has hit but if it has hit above the roll the ball or at the top of the roll the ball tends to loop up off the pad okay that is your indication that the ball has either hit the top of the roll or it has hit the flap uh, in fact the loop is definitely the flap and if it's hit the top of the roll then it tends to shoot upwards off the top of the roll, okay, at a greater speed than if it hits the flap. When it hits the flap, it's at a slower speed, but goes up. And if it's on the roll or the top of the roll, it's at a faster speed that also goes up. So there you need to know, or that will be your clue that it hit either the top of the roll or the flap. And depending on how far forward uh, the batter is and how tall the striker is, uh, it probably will be going over the stumps. Last law for me this evening, another contentious one, obstructing the field. And we have another animation video to take us through the law. Obstructing the field. A batsman is out obstructing the field if he or she willfully attempts to obstruct or distract the fielding side by word or action. Like this, for example. Thank you, Tommy. 
In particular, it is considered to be obstruction if, while the ball is in play and after the striker has played the ball, either batsman willfully strikes the ball with a hand not holding the bat or any other part of his or her person or with the bat. The exception to this is when the batsman is attempting to defend his or her wicket. The batsman may do this with the bat or any part of his or her person, except with a hand not holding the bat. If the batsman uses such a hand, he or she will be out obstructing the field. The handled the ball law no longer exists, with such incidents now covered by obstructing the field instead. The obstruction has to be willful. Accidental obstruction or obstruction caused by trying to avoid injury does not count and the decision on that is down to the umpire. It's worth noting that if a catch is obstructed, it is the striker who is out, even if it was the non-striker who caused the obstruction. Mind you, it's not always an easy decision. Here, the batsman deliberately crosses out of the legal running area in order to attempt to obstruct a throw. There is no other reason why the batsman should be running across the pitch. What looked an accident was, in fact, an illegal incident. To avoid any possible confusion, read Law 37 in black and white in the blue book. Let's have a look at a real life incident of a obstructing the field dismissal. Oh, danger, danger. Now then, what have they done here? Dead ball, called dead ball. They've fired up South Africa. Now he's called dead ball to sort out the issue. Well, he's gone across to the other side of the pitch and that'll be something umpires will take into consideration. He's on one side, gets over the other side. He's not looking at the ball, the ball strikes him. Would he have got in? He was looking at the ball initially though, wasn't he? He wants the single, Livingston calls him back. At this point, Roy gets across to the other side and then he is watching the ball. Whether you can say he's got himself deliberately between the ball and the stumps, I'm not sure. Come on, umpire Lloyd. And it's Jason Roy. Well, it's Jason Roy who's disappointed and the crowd as well. A ring of boos goes around the ground, but I'm sure the third umpire has given him out because Roy has crossed paths. He's got over to the other side of the pitch, got himself between ball and stumps and in the third umpire's opinion he's done that deliberately so Roy's innings a very good innings comes to an end 67 from 45 133 for three perfectly described there by Michael Atherton and even though Jason Roy was shaking his head going off the field he knew exactly what he was doing and that is why the umpire gave him out obstructing the field. Are there any runs scored when a batter is out obstructing the field? Let's see what the law says. When either batter is dismissed obstructing the field, unless the obstruction or distraction prevents the striker from being out caught, any runs completed by the batters before the offence shall be scored together with any one-run penalty for noble or wide, or any other award of five penalty runs to either side. If the obstruction or distraction prevents the striker from being out caught, any runs completed by the batters shall not be scored, but any penalties awarded to either side shall stand. And the bowler does not get credit for the dismissal of obstructing the field. That are the laws that I'm covering for this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Abdullah will now take us through laws 38 to 40 
and then afterwards we'll take us through a match preparation presentation. Over to you, Abdullah. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. Good evening to you and good evening to the rest of the attendees. I'm kicking off with Law 38, which is the run out law. So how is a, a either of the batters out run out? Let's have a look at what the law tells us. The law says that either batter is out run out if while the ball is in play, while the ball is still alive, either of the batters is out of his or her ground, i.e. nothing uh, of, of, of the person or the bat behind the popping crease, and the wicket is fairly put down by the action of any fielder. We've uh, heard in, earlier, in an earlier law that you can be run out of a no ball, so that's in the last point here. Even uh, if a no ball is called, you can still be run out. And whether or not a run is attempted or not, that is irrelevant. So just to summarize again, either batters out run out while the ball is still in play. And either batter is out of his or her ground and the wicket is fairly put down by any of the fielders. And it is irrelevant whether a run or not is being attempted. You need to be, while the ball is still alive, you need to be behind or have some part of either your body or your bat behind the popping crease. When is a batter not run out? A batter is not run out if the batter made his or her ground and then subsequently had to leave the ground to avoid injury and then the wicket is put down. An example of this is the, the uh, striker hits the ball to fine leg, they run a single, the non-striker made good use of her ground at the now uh, striker's end. The, the fine leg fielder picks up the ball, throws it in towards the keeper, the throw is a bit uh, off radar, the the non-striker now sees the ball come straight to his or her head. So after making um, his or her ground at the striker's end, the, uh, seeing the ball coming straight at his head, he now gives way and then subsequently leaves his or her crease to avoid injury. And if that is the case, and then the wicket gets put down, the, the non-striker will be not run out. And the reason is, was in his ground, he only left it to avoid being hit by the ball. But the important part is, first, uh, the, uh, the batter need, needed to have made his ground and then left it, and only to avoid injury. Also, batter is not run out if the ball has not been touched by any of the fielders. There are 11 fielders uh, on, the uh, on the field. Uh, the bowler is a fielder and the wicketkeeper is also, as per the law, classified as a fielder. So for a runner to be affected, it, the ball must be touched by any of the fielders. If none of the fielders touch the ball, either batter shall not be run out. An example of this, if you can just visualize uh, bowler bowling and the bowler bowls uh, a full, let's say full delivery, the striker hits it straight back down the, uh, the pitch. The, non, uh, the, the bowler tries to get a hand uh, to it, but the bowler does not get a hand to it. The ball then goes against the stumps. And the non-striker, let's say, is a meter outside his or her crease. That will not be outrun out. And the reason for that is 
the, yes, the wicket was put down, and yes, the striker was outside his or her crease, but a fielder did not touch the ball. So it's important for a runner to be affected that the fielder must touch the ball. Just use another example. Uh, again, bowler balls, a full ball. The ball gets hit by the striker uh, directly uh, to the non-striker. The ball then ricochets from the non-striker onto the wicket at the bowler's end and dislodges the bail and the non-striker is a meter outside his or her crease. So striker hits the ball straight at the batter and from the, the non-striker it ricochets Onto the onto the stumps at the wicket keep at the bowlers in, putting the the stumps down with the with the non striker meter outside his or crease. Again, that will not be out run out. Yes, even though the non striker was a meter outside his crease, but it will not be out run out because for that for a run out to be affected, I feel the need to touch the ball, and in this case. The other batter or the non-striker touched the ball and then went on to the wicket. He, uh, the non-striker is not one of the fielders, hence not run out. A batter is also uh, not run out uh, if a no ball has been called and the striker is uh, out stumped. So you can just visualize the uh, no ball's been called for, for, for uh, let's say, front foot. The striker uh, steps out, misses the ball. The keeper takes off the bails. So the striker is not out stumped because you cannot be stumped off a no ball. The striker will also not be out run out in this instance. Point 38.3, this is a new addition to the run-out law. It's actually not a new addition. All the lawmakers did was, this particular section of the law was placed under Law 41, which covers fair and unfair play. So effective October 2022, the 1st of October 2022, the lawmakers moved this particular section from under Law 41 and they moved it to under the run-out law. So what is this law? It is non-striker leaving his or her ground early and the bowler then trying to run out the non-striker. So this is not a new uh, law. All the lawmakers did was they moved it from under law 41 and they placed it now under the run-out law. Why did they move it? Uh, currently, under Law 41, which covers a fair and uh, unfair play, for many years, um, uh, fair players felt that before running out the non-striker, you need to give the non-striker a friendly warning and then a first warning and then a final warning before you allow to run out the non-striker. And if uh, when a bowler do or did, decided to run out the non-striker, there was a big stigma. Everyone was saying this is against the spirit um, of of uh, the game. It should not uh, be allowed. So there was lots of controversy when this particular mode of dismissal or this particular um, this particular incident takes place. The lawmakers decided to get rid of this controversy. Let's move it to the run-out law. So if the, if the bowler now tries to run out the non-striker, it now falls under a mode of dismissal. So all the umpire needs to decide is whether when the bowler uh, uh, put the wicket down, was the non-striker in his or her ground? If yes, not out. If no, the, non the umpire needs to give out the non-striker run out. So how do you run out the non-striker? We There is a video that's coming up next that will explain in detail how to run out the non-striker by the bowler. 
there is a window period for this to take place. And before I show you the video, and I want you to take note of it, it starts, uh, the, the, the window period starts once the bowler takes his or her first step, and it ends when uh, that bowler would normally have expected to release the ball. So between the moment the bowler takes his or her first step until the instant when the bowler would normally have released the ball, that is the window period uh, for the bowler to run out the non-striker. Let's look at a video that will clearly illustrate what this means. Running out the non-striker. Running out the non-striker occurs when a bowler runs out a batsman who has strayed too early out of the popping crease by removing the bales. It is a much debated form of dismissal, with some suggesting that a warning should be given. However, leaving his or her ground early is an attempt by the non-striker to gain an unfair advantage, and it puts a batsman at risk of getting out. The law doesn't require the bowler to give a warning, and he or she is entitled to run out the non-striker until the moment when he or she would normally have been expected to release the ball. In which case, it's perfectly fair for the bowler to run the non-striker out. For more detail on this perfectly legal practice, see Law 4116 in the MCC's The Laws of Cricket. Again, to emphasize, uh, the window period starts from the moment the, bo the bowler takes his or her first step and it ends the moment uh, the bowler would have normally released uh, the ball. We're now going to look at an incident that happened recently in an ODR between uh, India and England that also illustrates where the bowler ran out the non-striker. Let's have a look at the video. For sure. I know it's in the laws of the game. I'm ready with my decision for the big screen. Yeah, so now. There's no more uh, controversy with regards to, uh, um, in cricketing terms, we call this the man cat. Um, uh, he was the first one in, I think, in the 1960s that um, did this type of dismissal and they named it after, after him. Now, this particular, uh, uh, this particular incident, uh, incident is under the mode of dismissal law. So the bowler is allowed to run out the no, the non-striker, no more warnings, it's no more against the spirit. The bow, the batter needs to stay behind, behind the popping crease until that ball is released. The ball is not, the bat, the non-striker is not allowed to move before then. Uh, if the non-striker moves before, the bowler has got the right to remove the bells and there's no more controversy. All you need to do is make a decision was the batter behind the crease, non striker behind the crease? Yes or no? If yes, not out. If 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 uh, no, you give the batter the non striker out. Law 39 stumped. Let's look at a video. Stumped. All batsmen fear being stumped, and all wicket keepers dream of stumping batsmen. So let's be clear about the law. The only player who can stump a batsman is this fellow, the wicketkeeper. A stumping can take place provided that the ball is not a no ball. You can be stumped off a wide, however. Here, for example, the batsman has moved out of his or her ground to play the ball, but has missed it and has not attempted a run. The wicket is fairly put down by the wicketkeeper without the intervention of another fielder. 
when all these conditions are met, the batsman will find that he or she has indeed been stumped. It's also okay for the ball to rebound onto the stumps off any part of the wicketkeeper, including his or her protective equipment or helmet. If it is a no ball, the batsman will not be outstumped and is also protected from being run out as long as he or she is not attempting a run. Don't be stumped about stumping. Get a copy of the Blue Book and study Law 39. The last law that I'm covering for this evening, and it's also the last type uh, mode of this missile uh, type, is called time out. Let's see what the law tells us, how this timed out law works. Law tells us that after the fall of a wicket or the retirement of a batter, the incoming batter, unless time was called, needs to be ready to receive the ball or for the other batter to receive the next ball within three minutes of the dismissal of the batter or the retirement of the batter. If this requirement is not met, the incoming batter will be out, timed out. In my 15 years of uh, umpiring, I've never given a batter out, uh, timed uh, out. I had occasions where a batter took uh, some time getting um, to the wicket. Well, I've, what is important is, firstly, before giving the batter out, go find out why this batter took a bit of time. And I'll, I'll use a practical example, what happened, uh, what happened uh, to me. The, uh, I was doing a club game and a wicket fell and then it it took qu quite a while for the next batter to get to the wicket. It was like more than three minutes. And the incoming batter came in and I asked him, why did it take you so long to get here? The the um, fielding side was saying, but I'm past all, well, it took too long. Uh, uh, the timeout law must apply here. Yeah? I asked the batter, why it took you so long? The batter informed me that uh, their club, they only have two sets of pads, gloves, when the uh, a batter gets dismissed, they first the 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 out batter needs to first take off the pads, the gloves, the, the thigh pad, and then the new batter needs to to put uh, on the the um, the equipment. That's why I took uh, the batter a bit of time to get to the wicket. Uh, yes, I I agree. The batter was not at the wicket within three minutes, and as per the law, so, so I'm not. So, as per the laws of cricket, if the batter is not ready to receive the ball within three minutes, you've got all the right to give the batter out. But I felt in this instance, with the side only having two sets of pads and gloves, I was not going to penalize them. Uh, then you'll probably have a, a situation where all the batters will be given out, timed out. I spoke to the, the fielding captain. I said, I said to the fielding captain, please don't appeal. Not going to give the batter out. I'm going to give them a bit of time to pair out. But don't get me wrong. The law tells us the batter needs to be there within three minutes. But I've just felt in my scenario to give the, uh, I gave the, the, the batting side a, a bit of leeway uh, because it's not their fault uh, that they only had two sets of pads and two sets of gloves for the batters at the wicket. And this type of uh, dismissal, the bowler does not get credit. So that is all laws that we are covering for this evening. I now have a few slides that uh, that uh, we've prepared. It's our, it's match preparation slides, and it covers the dress code of the umpire, umpiring equipment and pre-match duties of the umpire. So in terms of dress code, sponsored hat or, or, or cap, 
if you if you if the ads are not sponsored by your local um, umpires association, you can go to one of the sports shops and then buy yourself one of the ads or cap. But it's it's important you're in the sun the whole day. You need to stand with a hat or a cap. It's important that your your uh, clothes needs to be clean and and iron. Your pants needs to be comfortable. What I do as well is um, if I buy my pants at, at one of the local trading stores and my pants is a bit long and a bit wide, I do uh, get a tailor that, the, that uh, my pants do sit com comfortably. When it comes to uh, shoes, excuse me, your shoes needs to be predominantly white or socks as well. And when it comes to umpiring shoes, I prefer the, uh, the running shoe. I know there are some umpires, some umpires that, that stand in cricketing shoes, whether it's the grey nickels or the kookaburra shoe. I know of one or two umpires that stands in, in batting spikes. Uh, it's up to the individual umpire. I prefer a running shoe because the running shoe's got extra bit of padding, extra bit of cushioning because you are, you are on your feet from 10 the morning till 6 uh, the evening. It's a long day and your feet need to be comfortable. Um, you should, as an umpire, you should be wearing a watch, a belt, and you're in the sun all day, your eyes take strain, uh, try to get a pair of uh, sunglasses. Again, you don't need to buy a name brand uh, um, clothes or shoes as long as it's uh, cleaned and you, you look like an umpire. It's important that when you get to the ground that you do look like an umpire. In terms of equipment, there are must-haves and there are some optional uh, extra equipment that you can have. Clicker, so must have a bowling card, a pen, a bowler's marker, spare bales, including heavy bales, scissors, or a nail clipper. On the next slide, I do have pictures of clickers, bowling, uh, bowling cards, and bowling markers. So, in terms of clickers, I always have a spare clicker in my bag just in case I, I, I need it. I always have spare pens. I actually take two pins with me on the um, onto the field. I put one in my right pocket and one pin in my left pocket. Just in case one of the pins decides not to work, I can then go to the other the other pin. Uh, uh, bowler's markers, I always keep a spare bale um, on me, one spare bale on me, and I keep the heavy bales uh, in my bag. Why do I keep a spare bale on me? Not to waste time. So if the bale gets, uh, uh, gets broken by the ball, I can just take the spare bale out of my pocket and, and we don't lose any time. And scissors, also important, or a nail clipper, players always come to you asking you to to cut off certain string or sometimes the on the ball um, um, there's something I need to cut off of the ball then you have a scissor and nail clipper. Optional extras, uh, spiky, bowlers the spikes become loose they always ask you umpire do you have a spiky? Uh, it is an optional extra but it's good to have a spiky you take it out of your pocket and give it to the bowler and the bowler can then tighten the spikes on his or her uh, bowling boot. Uh, ball gates, uh, good to have a ball gates. Uh, you will find, uh, uh, you will find the fielding side saying, oh, umpire, the ball is out of shape. The ball is out of shape. You just take out your ball gates. If it, uh, you put it through the ball gates, if it goes through, it's still in shape. If it doesn't, then you know the ball is out of shape. Uh, sweets, I always take uh, sweets onto the field with me. I prefer the, um, the, uh, Sweets, just your mouth gets dry. So just to occasionally, I just put a sweet uh, in my mouth just to get some taste uh, and to get the dryness out of my mouth. Your yeah, example of uh, Pixar top left, that's a bowling marker. So bowlers would usually come ask you, Ampa, do you have a bowling marker? You hand it over to the bowler. The bowler will mark out these or run up and use um, the bowling marker. Um, to know where they should start their run up from. Bottom left is uh, a ball gauge. 
top uh, right is uh, clicker and top uh, um, right on the bottom is uh, the spiky. In the middle is an example of a bowling card where you write the bowlers the names and the overs that they've bowled uh, as well as the overs completed, the wickets, times, uh, start of the rings. Um, yeah. Equipment in your bag. So what do you need to put in your bag? It's always good to have a spare standing shirt if you can. Uh, odd days, you, you get sweaty um, during lunchtime or the tea interval. Uh, it helps if you can change your standing shirt. Uh, tape measure. Why do you need a tape measure? Part of your pre-umpire -um duties is to measure the, the creases, the and uh, and the pits. It's good to have a five meter and a 30 meter uh, tape. Why the 30 meter tape? In white ball cricket, 20 overs and 30 oh, and, and 50 over cricket, uh, we do need to to measure the inner circle because there are there's a playing condition in place that that tells us that certain amount of fielders needs to be in the inner circle for certain amount of overs. Law book, put it in your bag, playing conditions, team seats, captains and violation reports, spare balls, sunscreen, toilet paper, optional extras that you can put in your bag, eye drops, uh, a spray. Um, I always keep spray in my bag. I, um, I like to smell nice. Lip balm, I do have in my bag. My, my lips take a beating and my lips get, uh, get dry. And... Usually the the home team give you lunch, but if you um, if you are a diabetic, uh, you can pack your own lunch. This is an example of a team seat on the left. This is the local team seat that we use in club cricket um, in the Western Province um, here in Cape Town. And on the right is a captain's report. There they evaluate the uh, the umpires and they'll they'll send it to um, the um, match secretary after the game. This is an example of the local violation of Western Province Code of Behaviour report. If there was a violation on the field. This is the, the form that we complete, and after completing it, we send it to the secretary, who in turn sends it to the mother body. And in terms of pre-match duties, so what do you do the night before the match? I always go through my playing conditions. I make sure that I, good, I get a good night's rest. If I don't know the field, I, what I do is a day or two before the game, I'll make sure that I use Google Maps um, or I, I can phone someone that can give me directions to the field. I pack my bag the night before the match. I do not wait until the morning because uh, sometimes you can be in a rush and forget something. And lastly, in terms of pre-match duties, so when you get to the field, the law tells us to be at the ground at least 45 minutes before play starts. Why? There's lots of duties that the umpires need to do. So if you do get there a bit early, wait for your partner. And once your partner arrives, together do your inspection of the field and the, the pitch. If, if the toss is going to take place, make sure that you have fully completed team seats. Agree with the captains, the balls. Make sure that the correct balls are used for that particular game. Uh, while you do your field inspection, if there are any overhanging trees, uh, make sure that you've discussed this with the captains before play starts. What are you going to do if there are any overhanging trees? Are you going to give a? Um, or are you going to handle it if the ball should hit the overhanging trees? Exactly the same with an obstacle that is inside the boundary. Synchronize your watches with your partner and the scorers. So make sure that the wickets are, properly, uh, are properly pitched. Go do your measurements. Check that the side screens are in line. Check 
where the covers are. If they do have a roller, go go check. If there are sawdust available, go double check. Ensure that the covers on the side of the pitch are, are dry and there's no standing water on the covers. When you do your pre-toss discussion with the captains, make sure that not only one umpire speaks, that both umpires speak to the captains at your pre-toss discussion. And no conversation about how the pitch might play and who should bat and who should bowl. Leave that up to the two sides they need to decide. And lastly, on the field of play, make your decisions without fear or favor and enjoy your umpiring. Thank you so much, Tom. I'm handing back over to you. Thanks, Abdullah. A uh, very useful presentation for those who have not umpired before and also those who have umpired can now take their umpiring to the next level with that pre-match preparation. Uh, that is part of the course material that I have sent out to everyone. Um, when I send out the invite to the lecture, um, actually, no, when I send out the recording of the lecture two hours afterwards, there are all the recordings of all the lectures as well as all the course material on that particular email. So please read through those emails carefully and thoroughly and you will receive all the course material. Those of you who have not received course material, check the emails that I've sent you before and you will see that it's there. If you haven't received any emails from me before, then um, put your email address in the chat box and I will send you all the course material as I have done in the last few minutes to two new candidates. So let's go through the questions in the chat box. First question is from Sandeep. He asks if there will be any exam questions on law 41 and 42. The answer is no, and that is why we are not going through laws 41 and 42. They are not examined in Cricket South Africa's level one exam. As mentioned, they are dealt with in level two and level three. So join us in March and April 2023 for level two and level three, and we shall go through laws 41 uh, in detail. Uh, we don't go through law 42 because law 42 is basically code of conduct and the code of conduct in every competition in every country is different from tournament to tournament. So rather go through the playing conditions for a particular tournament when it comes to the code of conduct and player behavior and how it is dealt with. First question of the evening is from uh, Datrum. Datrum is a very eager umpire from the questions that he's asking, and he will be joining us in Cape Town on exchange uh, later this year. I think he's flying in in November. Um, so, Datrum, we're happy to um, help you do your best in Cape Town by answering some of these questions. Um, Abdullah, Datrum asks if he can, if we can recommend any drills to get our eye in as an umpire, or should he just observe the players in the nets? Uh, in addition, uh, can we recommend any drills to improve vision, concentration? and hearing abilities as an umpire. Uh, I'll give my input first and then I'll hand over to you for any extra advice, Abdullah. Um, so definitely net practices are the best place for umpires to improve um, their umpiring. And you can stand at uh, bowler's end and as if you are in a match and judge the uh, back foot and the front foot landing of the bowler, as well as the um, leg before wicket decisions or any other decisions that might be appealed for. Um, just ask the teams if they want 
uh, you to call no balls or not. Some bowlers don't really care. I don't know why, but um, some bowlers are happy to bowl big no balls in the nets. Uh, they say they'll sort it out in the game. What's important for net practice is to uh, try and get that muscle memory in you because what you're doing is you are watching the back foot land, the front foot land, and then you try and go up to the hand to see if possible the ball leaving the hand. Why that helps is because you can see if the bowler is trying to bowl an off cutter, a leg cutter, or if it's a spinner, if he or she is bowling a normal off spinner, or if he or she is attempting a dursra or any other variation that is different to the bowler's stock delivery. Um, also, I find to judge the swing of a delivery, the earlier you pick it up out of the bowler's hand, the better that you will follow the ball uh, to the impact with the striker, whether it's the pad or the bat or the glove or wherever else the batter is hitting the ball. Uh, what I've also found is an interesting um, drill is going behind the net, behind the striker, and closing your eyes and just listening to the sounds and picking up the different sounds. Is it tick boof? Is it boof tick? Is it uh, a glove? Uh, is it just pad? Is it body? Um, you can uh, train your ears to differentiate between the different sounds uh, when the ball makes uh, contact with either bat or person. Uh, and of course, you can ask the striker, uh, was that bat or was that pad or did you hit the ground? Uh, it's a rapport building exercise as well, going to net practice. Abdullah, um, any advice from your side in terms of improving your hearing or your vision? Uh, thanks, Tom. Again, I just want to emphasize the importance of going uh, to net. Uh, just as players uh, goes or have net practices uh, regularly, it's just as important for umpires to go to net to get the uh, the eye in. So I just wanted to emphasize uh, that uh, point, uh, Tom. And and also uh, what you can do is uh, before the the match starts, players usually warm up. They use they are usually bowling practice. Uh, nothing stopping you from standing while the players are having bowling practice to get your eye in, or just standing next to the, uh, let's say close to the pitch and just watching the players bowl and following the ball with your eyes. That's that's another way of of just getting your eye in before the 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 game starts. Um, I've seen some umpires use the, the uh, before a game starts um, three three balls that they got three balls in their bag and they use the, to juggle the ball and that juggling act just help getting getting the the eyes uh, in and um, there was also a question about uh, how do you improve your concentration. There's only one way that you improve your concentration because the fitter you are the better your concentration will get. So definitely work hard on your fitness. Thanks, Tom. Over to you. I've just remembered uh, following on from your preparation presentation, Abdullah, is before every match, I always use eye drops to clean my eyes and also earbuds to clean my ears. Um, not sure how much it helps, but psychologically, I feel like I see better. I feel like I hear better and I'm ready to go onto the field after clearing my 
eyes and cleaning my ears. Next question also from Datrum. Um, he wants to go back to the Baba Azam video we showed yesterday where he picked up the wicketkeeper's glove and uh, caught the throw coming in from uh, the wicketkeeper Rizwan. Datrum asks, if Baba Azam wore the glove, but the throw didn't come into him and he did not touch the ball with the glove, uh, would we still award five penalty runs to the batting side? Dula? Daitram, no, you would not. You will only apply uh, the illegal fielding law if, while the ball was still in play, uh, and Baba put, as Baba did, the ball was still in play, he put his hand into the, uh, the, the keeper's glove that was lying on the floor, and he then collected the ball. So in that instance, you will apply the legal fielding law and give five penalty runs. But, for, but to answer your question, if Baba picked up the ball, put it, uh, picked up the, the glove, put it in his hand, and let's say the ball was thrown to the, key, to the bowler's end, no five penalty runs will apply. That will not be legal fielding. It will only be illegal fielding if while that ball is still in play, uh, and Baba picked up the glove, put it in his hand, and then touched that ball. Only then the illegal fielding law will be applicable. Uh, but, Aitram, what I will tell Baba is, let's say the ball doesn't go to Baba, and I see Baba picking up the glove and actually putting in, uh, putting his hand in it, I will go whisper in Baba's ear, Baba, please don't do that again, uh, uh, because... If while the ball was still in play, you touch the ball with the glove, uh, with, uh, uh, while your hand is in the glove, it will be legal fielding and there will be consequences like the five penalty runs. Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Um, so Sorry I'm... to interrupt. This is Sandeep here. I have a quick additional question on this. Um, although the ball was not been caught um, by Barber in the in the follow-up question, but what if he had a glove on his right hand and he collects the ball with the left hand? Yeah, the ball needs to touch the touch. Yeah, um, exactly the glove for five penalty runs to be awarded. It yeah. has to be in contact with the ball. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next question, also from Datrum. I think he tried to complete an over of six uh, deliveries here. Um, if the batter, whilst facing the delivery, breaks the stumps, removing only one bale from the stumps, and then the ball hits the stumps again, so there are two possible dismissals here, hit wicket or bold, which mode of dismissal will apply? Datrum thinks that it would be hit wicket since the wicket is already put down before the striker got bowled. Uh, Datrum, uh, we, I mentioned earlier this evening that bold is the big boss of all the modes of dismissal. And Abdullah mentioned yesterday that if one bell is removed, then the wicket can be put down again by the other bell being removed. So in your scenario, the bold dismissal is valid. And if bold happens on any delivery with any other mode of dismissal possible, bold is the big boss and the striker will, will be out bold, even though hit wicket happened first, remember what I said, it doesn't matter what happens first, if bold is valid, then bold will take precedence. So the striker will be out bold. Another question from Datrum. Are we, as on-field umpires, allowed to have small snacks like sweets and nuts during the game? Abdullah mentioned it in his match preparation presentation that he enjoys sweets and it is very much allowed. Going through the chat box, I see answers to the hit wicket appeal. 
against Brendan Taylor. Uh, quite a few not outs, but I also see a couple of people, three people saying out hit wicket. Um, it is an opinion as to whether you feel the striker has completed receiving the delivery or not. And in my opinion, I would say that he had already completed receiving the delivery when he put the wicket down. So he should have been given not out. The third umpire that was referred to for the decision, he gave the striker out hit wicket. And Murray Rasmus, you saw, was one of the on-field umpires. He told us that in the debrief with the match referee after that match, the match referee marked the umpire down, the third umpire down for giving that decision out hit wicket because the general consensus was that the striker, Brendan Taylor, had completed receiving the delivery before he put his wicket down, so he should have been not out hit wicket. Next question is from Satrugna. A fair delivery touches the striker's bat and goes to a slip fielder. The fielder fumbles and then the ball hits the portion of his trousers lying on the ground and bounces up. And then the fielder completes the catch. Out or not out? So, Abdullah, I'm thinking that this fielder is wearing big trousers that are um, a protruding sort of away from the fielder's leg and the ball bounces on the trousers which are on the ground. So the fielder obviously is on the floor and the ball bounces on the trousers which are on the ground and then after the bounce the court the catch is taken uh, would you as an umpire consider that out court or would you consider it as not out because of the bounce who asked the question Peter? satrugna Sat oh, so, so, to, so, to, no. so sure, it's hard to believe that the uh, field uh, a player will feel with such big uh, clothing, uh, but just in, in your example. So the pants is part of the, uh, of the clothing of uh, the fielder. And for a catch not to be valid, it needs to make contact with the ground. So you need to ask yourself the question, did the ball make contact with the ground if they are before um, the catch was taken if your answer to that question is yes it will give the batter not out if the answer to that question is no the batter will then be not out so to answer your question did the ball make contact with the ground and taking into account the trouser is part of the fielder's person similarly to let's say a a, a boot if the mm. ball goes uh, against the boot, up and up to the air, up and uh, to the air, and gets taken. That will be a legal catch. I'm applying the same principle here. The ball did not touch the the ground. The trouser is part of the fielder's person. Uh, so in in this case, I'll give the batter out court because the the ball did not touch the ground. That's my interpretation, Tom. I don't know if you have a different one. I agree with the interpretation, Abdullah. Um, I just think it will be very difficult as an on-field umpire to see the ball touching only the pants which are on the ground and then bouncing up for the catch to be fairly taken. Um, if we did not have the um, the technology to refer to a TV umpire and I had to come together with you, Abdullah, we would have seen a bounce 
and we would have probably decided that it bounced on the grass and not the pants. Very unlikely that it only bounces on the pants and not the grass. Um, so um, if we don't have the benefit of a replay to go upstairs to a TV umpire, I'm sure you and I would give that uh, not out. But if we do have the benefit of uh, replays and the I was the TV umpire and I saw that it clearly bounced on the pants and not the ground, uh, then I would give it out court. Deborah asks for um, course material. Deborah, please put your email address in the chat box and I will send you the course material at the end of this uh, lecture. Next question is from Sega. If the bowler is bowling round the wicket, is there anything extra to be considered for an LBW decision? Abdullah, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, yes, Tom. So, Sega, uh, when it comes to the LBW uh, laws, it stays exactly the same whether you're bowling over or around the wicket. Uh, Tom went through it uh, earlier. So firstly, it should not be a no ball. Uh, it should either uh, pitch outside the, the uh, off stump or in a line with the wicket. If it pitch outside leg, it can never uh, be, be out LBW. The impact needs to be between uh, wicket and, and wicket. And then lastly, it will have gone on to hit the stumps. So those rules, uh, the LBW rule stays exactly whether you're bowling over or around the wicket. Where you do take into, uh, into account whether the bowler is bowling over uh, or around the wicket uh, are things like angles, um, uh, Sega. So if a bowler is bowling, uh, let's say it's a right-hand bowler, bowling around the wicket to a left-handed uh, batter, uh, you, you will always see, or most of the time, the angle of that particular ball will always tend to go across the left-handed batter. So those are the additional information that you take into account when, uh, when adjudicating the LBW. Other type of additional information you take into account is where the batter is standing, is the batter standing deep, in his or crease, uh, or or a meter or, uh, or a half a meter or meter outside the the um, the, the crease, um, how high the ball was. You know, these those are just examples of additional information that helps you adjudicate the LBW decision. But when it comes to the rules of LBW, they stay exactly the same whether you're bowling over or around the wicket. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Another question from uh, Datrum. If a batter is shorter than Temba Bavuma and the ball hits him above the knee roll, then that batter could be out leg before wicket. What are your thoughts, uh, Datrum? You need to consider uh, where in the crease the batter is standing, as Abdullah has just mentioned. And what I mentioned as well in my presentation is when you are at the striker's end, you will see how high the batter's pads are in relation with the stumps and the bales. Um, so yes, a short batter with short pads, even if he or she is hit above the roll, uh, possibly back in his or her crease, that won't be an issue for height. Um, but please um, be cognizant of the bounce of the pitch as well before you give your decision. Next question is from Bart. Is it possible that a run out of the non striker can be judged as mock fielding when a bowler doesn't release the ball because the batter expected the ball to be released. Abdullah, a bit of a technical one there for you. Uh, Bart, thanks for your question. 
Uh, but there is a law that actually covers when a bowler does not release uh, uh, the ball. We've covered it under the dead ball law. So it's clear as soon as a bowler goes through his or her action and does not deliver the ball, either umpire to call and signal dead ball. So the moment the bowler doesn't release the ball, dead ball, and and we've we said that once you've called dead ball, anything that happens after that is irrelevant. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Abdullah. Uh, another question from Datrum. I think this is his sixth and final delivery of the over. Uh, will Western Province Cricket Umpires Association provide umpiring kit or do we need to procure them ourselves? Uh, so Datrum, the association provides standing shirts which are sponsored and branded Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. We also sponsor and brand our hats, our floppy hats and caps. Um, so those are the two pieces of clothing that uh, you can purchase from the association. In fact, uh, the way we do it is that when you stand your first two or three matches, you are in effect paying your membership fees as well as buying your clothing. So you won't be paid for your first two or three matches because you will be um, given clothing and you will be paying your membership fees of 500 rands uh, with your match fees for your first three matches. So say for example, uh, you stand in a 50 over uh, match and it is um, standing fee of 450 rands. So you have almost covered your membership fees of 500 rands. Your next match is another 50 over match and you earn another 450 rands. That will complete your membership fees of 500 rands and it will also pay for your standing shirt, which I think is 250 rands, and it will also pay for your hat, which is 150 rands. So uh, that is how we, how members earn their clothing. You cannot uh, buy your clothing upfront. Uh, we need to have members officiate in matches to earn their Western Province Cricket Umpires Association branded clothing. Uh, what we do also uh, provide for members is uh, heavy bales because those are difficult to find. Uh, we are busy negotiating with the supplier to get us heavy bales because the wind does pick up quite heavily in Cape Town, especially during the summer months. Uh, but equipment such as a clicker, and a bowler's marker you would need to purchase at a uh, sports shop. Uh, the most popular one here in South Africa is called Sportsman's Warehouse. Uh, they have uh, those two pieces of equipment. And then uh, last but not least, the bowling card that uh, Abdullah uh, mentioned and showed a, a picture of. Uh, that one is provided free by the association, so you will get that at the first meeting that you attend here in Cape Town. Um, next question from Yomi asking for course material. I've sent it to him, as well as Osita Dinma. I've also sent you course material. Last question from Datrum that I've seen. There might be more later. Uh, yes, you can get a copy of captain's reports. We normally don't give it to members, but for exchange umpires who want to develop their umpiring, what we do is we can get you all of your captain's reports at the end of your trip in Cape Town. Uh, we won't give you your captain's report after each game. You will get all of them at the end of your trip after all of your games. Why don't we give it to you immediately after your 
match is because we don't want you to have a negative or overly positive relationship with the captain that you got a bad or seriously good report from. Um, we need to keep that relationship professional. And yes, we might discuss any issues that come out of captain's reports, uh, but we will not make it available to the particular umpire. We will just mention that there is a trait or a decision that he or she needs to work on. OK, so Datrum, uh, you will get all your reports that and that will be your proof of having umpired in South Africa at the end of your trip. Next question is from Sega. Please explain a little bit more about catches at the boundary. What if the fielder took a catch, held it for three to four seconds and went out of the boundary and throws it inside before going out side the boundary? Um, is it out? Or can we allow the fielder to go out of the boundary after taking a catch? Abdullah, um, you did take us through, or was it me who took us through uh, boundary catches in Law 19? Do you want to try and summarize some of the points to consider here? Yes, Tom. Sega, thank you so much for your question. First point I want to uh, to make is when it comes to taking a catch. So the law tells us so as soon as the uh, the fielder makes contact with the ball. The catch will be taken as soon as the catch, let's say the ball is in his or her hand and the fielder is in control of the ball and of his or her movement. Once in control of the ball and in control of his or her movement, then from that moment, the catch is then complete. That's firstly what I want to say. Secondly, so when it comes to boundary fielding, these are the important facts that you need to consider. Firstly, the first contact by the boundary fielder needs to be inside the field of play. That's the first criteria that must be met for a legal catch to be to be taken. First contact by the by the fielder needs to be within the field of play. Once that first contact was within the field of play, that fielder is now allowed to go outside the boundary and then hit the ball or make contact with the ball, but that fielder now needs to make sure that there is no contact or the, the fielder is not in contact with the ground or any object outside the field of play while in contact with uh, the ball. So I'll just repeat what, I, what I've just said. First contact by the fielder must be within the field of play. If the answer to that question is yes, the first contact was within the field of play, then that fielder is now allowed to go outside the boundary and actually hit the ball back or touch the ball. But there is a condition. So as soon as that fielder, after touching the, the first contact being within the boundary, now goes outside the boundary, that fielder is now allowed to hit the ball back, but at no stage must that fielder, while now outside the boundary, be in uh, contact with the ground and with the ball at the same time. If that is the case, it will then be boundary or boundary uh, six. So to come back to 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 your question. So so what my understanding is the first contact by this fielder was within the field of play, but then you say the fielder then held it for three or four seconds and then went outside the boundary. So even it were, though it was in the fielder's uh, hands for quite a while. I, I can see that this fielder was not in control of, of his or her movement. So that means this catch was not completed yet. 
So now the fielder then goes outside the boundary. Now the law allows this fielder to go outside the boundary. Why? Because this fielder first made contact with the ball inside the field of play. And then after going now outside, that field is now allowed to handle that ball as long as there's no, as long as the fielder uh, doesn't make contact uh, with the, the ground outside the boundary and the ball at the, the same time. So the fielder can then jump up in the air outside the boundary, hit the ball back uh, inside the boundary as long as the fielder doesn't make contact with the ground and the ball at the same time. Uh, Tom, uh, did I answer the question? Abdullah, I think you did more than answer the question. Uh, thumbs up from Sega. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah just, yeah, just to add, uh, for a second fielder, uh, um, because lots of time you see Sega boundary catches and the, there's a second fielder involved as well, the same principle apply applies for the second fielder. The second fielder also first needs to make contact with in the field of play for that fielder to go outside the boundary. If that second fielder didn't first make contact with the ball inside of play, the second fielder is not allowed as per the law to, to handle the ball outside the boundary. Bottom line, same principle apply to first fielder and second fielder. Thanks, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. We've got another question about uh, fair catches. It comes from Ivan Shema. When the wicketkeeper catches the ball as a court behind and he takes it smartly, he celebrates by trying to throw the ball up in the air, as they quite often do. Uh, but in doing so, he hits his hand with the ball in hand against his leg and the ball falls down. Is that considered a drop or is it considered a fair catch? Abdullah, you want to take us through that Herschel Gibbs incident? Uh, yes, Tom. I'll, I'll, first, I'll first answer. I can't remember the name you said. Ivan Sema, I think you said. I'll first right. answer that question, but I'll answer it uh, with, um, with the law. So the law tells us that for cats, fair cats to be taken, the fielder needs to be in control of the ball and of his or her movements. And if that is the case, once the fielder is in control of the ball and of his or her movements, then the catch is completed. So now in your scenario, you need to ask yourself the question, looking at, at, at the scenario, was the wicket keep or the fielder in control of the ball and of his or her movements? If your answer to that question is yes, that catch is com then complete, the batter will then be out. If your answer to those questions are no, the wicket keeper was not in control of the ball nor his or her movements, then the, the batter will be uh, not out. So this is an uh, opinion law, and you looking at the scenario, you need to make the, uh, the, the, the judgment call by applying the law. Was in control of the ball and movement? If yes, striker out. If no, striker, striker not out. Uh, in the 1999 World Cup, there was an example, uh, South Africa played Australia in the, the, the semi-final and Ursel Gibbs was standing at mid-wicket and Gibbs was trying to do exactly the same thing. Um, Steve Waugh hit the ball straight to Gibbs at mid-wicket. Gibbs taking the ball, then tr uh, um, try to, in celebration, try to throw the ball in the air. In Trying to throw the ball in the air, the ball hit, hit Gibbs's, uh, Russell Gibbs's leg. Gibbs then tried to grab the ball a second, a second time. So that for me was a clear indication. Why would Gibbs try to grab the ball for a second time? That's for me a clear indication that um, he was not in control of the ball at that time. 
So that's why that particular uh, um, incident, the striker or Steve Waugh was given not out. Steve Waugh then went on to make, I'm not sure if it's a ton or close to a ton, and Australia went to win the game. And, and yeah, and South Africa, yeah, the rest is history. Uh, but to come just to summarize what I'm saying, you need to look at the scenario. Was the keeper in control of the ball and of his movements? If your answer to that question is yes, that, that catch is complete, you then can give the batter out. If your answer to those questions are no, that batter is then not out. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Very well explained, as usual. Next question is from Greg. If a batter comes in with a bat that is not legal in dimensions, but you as an umpire don't have a bat gate, how do you as an umpire prevent the player from using that particular bat? Um, so, Greg, you can't really say to the batter that his or her bat is not legal if you do not have a bat gauge. Um, it's as simple as that. Similar to the judging of a fair delivery in terms of how the arm is straight or bending. Uh, remember that in the ICC playing conditions, a uh, arm is allowed to flex 15 degrees. You cannot with the naked eye know whether the elbow has flexed 15 degrees or more or less. Um, so similarly with a bat, you can suspect that it is bigger than the required dimensions, but you cannot be sure without using a bat gauge. So I would in that situation uh, try and get a hold of a bat gauge at the earliest interval or the next interval and then check it. Um, but the best thing is for you to have a bat gauge and check it before. Uh, what we did at our uh, tournament uh, a couple of weeks ago, Cricket South Africa's Division 2 T20 competition, and I'm sure Abdullah and uh, the rest of the umpires have done so for the Division 1 competition that is taking place at the moment, uh, we checked uh, all the teams bats at net practices the day before the tournament started and uh, we did not come across any bats that were bigger than the legal limit uh, and we checked it using the bat cages. In the 100 competition held in England they have a bat gauge the umpires check the sizes of the bat as the striker comes in to bat. Uh, we initially were going to implement the same checking mechanism, but we thought that it is distracting of the batter to have his bat checked uh, as he arrives at the crease and also could involve time wasting. So that is why we as a team of umpires from Cricket South Africa have decided to check uh, teams' bats collectively before the tournament starts. Yes, you could argue that they are hiding uh, bats uh, knowing that they're going to be checked and so they don't come to practice with their biggest bats, which could be illegal. Uh, but if we do suspect that a bat is too big uh, on the field, then we will check it at the next interval uh, because I do not carry a bat gauge with me on the park. Uh, uh, Tom, can I just add something? Please do. So, so uh, what we did at, um, at the T20 tournament currently in Potsdam. So pre-tournament, we checked all the bats um, using the bat gauge and uh, everyone was compliant. But what we also did wa was, before the inning starts, we will sit close to the dugout. And as the batters come out to bat, 
Well, uh, with, let's say the opening batsmen before coming, we just double check their bats. Just in case mm. they didn't show us any legal bat while we did our bat inspection before the tournament starts. And every single batter, as they sit in the dugout, as they come down to sit in the dugout before going into bat, we will put the bat through the bat gates. It literally takes two seconds to do it. But that's that's how we proactively handled, um, just in case a, uh, one of the players would hide an illegal bat and then try to go bat with it. Uh, secondly, a thought has popped in, just that popped into my head, uh, just with regards to you know checking these dimensions. So I'm asking, seeing that Tom, that we do know the dimensions of, of uh, the um, according to the law of the bat, like mm -hmm. the width 10.8, depth 6.7, it is four centimeters. So I'm asking. Uh, so let's say we visually see the bat that comes out to bat. Ooh, this bat looks a bit uh, thick. Can we let uh, at the next interval use our measuring tape? Just to double check, do you think we can do that? Or um, is the measurement tapes not that accurate and, and you can't really check the dimensions using a normal measuring tape? I think you can check the width with the measuring tape and you can also check the edges of, with the measuring tape, but you wouldn't really be able to check the depth of the bat um in terms of the thickness where the what they call the meat of the bat protrudes from the back of the bat um so it's it's not a perfect science abdullah but i think if you do find that the width or the edges are too big uh, then yes there's nothing stopping you from from um checking at the interval um again you don't want to waste time though because your measuring tape would normally not be with you. Uh, but yes, if it's a tea break and the batter is still batting during a tea break, then you can uh, go and uh, get your measuring tape out of the bag and check it tea break or lunch break. I wouldn't really do it during a drinks break. Um, I think, yeah, it, it's 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 too much trouble for a for a short break to to go through with that um and i mean that does need to apply in club cricket because we as a um body of umpires here in western province cricket umpires association um out of the 120 umpires that we have only uh four or five of us have bat gauges um those of us who are on or have been on Cricket South Africa's uh, national panels. Um, so we are not equipped currently to uh, all check with bat gauges uh, the legality of bats. So a uh, very good idea, possibly something that we can implement uh, in seasons to come. I think it would be a bit uh, strange for us to introduce something mid-season, Abdullah. Uh, but I will suggest it with the cricket committee for um, umpires to be able to check using their tape measure the legality of bats. Uh, which brings us to our next question from Greg. Where can one buy a bat and a ball gauge? Um, They're not easily available. Definitely Sportsman's Warehouse doesn't have either. Um, Ball gauges are more commonly available than bat gauges. I have found ball gauges at uh, specialist cricket shops. Uh, I got mine from uh, Kookaburra, uh, who make ball gauges, uh, obviously, because they make balls. Bat gauges, I don't know. We got given by Cricket South Africa. I'm not sure if there are any retailers in South Africa who make bat gauges. Um, so Greg, you'll have to uh, promote yourself and work hard enough to get on to Cricket South Africa's national panel for you to be given a bat gauge. Ladies and gents, uh, that looks like all the questions on the chat box have been covered. Um, I don't see any hands in the air for open questions. Uh, what I will do is take uh, the next couple of minutes just to 
mention the plan for next week. Uh, next week, Monday, we have our revision lecture. Abdullah will take us through uh, all the slides in the presentation uh, that have green text in them. Those are content that is examined in the level one Cricket South Africa umpiring exam. So he will only be going through those slides and those animation videos that are examined in the level one exam. So that'll be the first hour of Monday's lecture. The second hour of Monday's lecture will be a click by click demonstration by me showing you how to register for the exam. Um, as mentioned previously, you will receive an exam link email on Saturday the 29th of October for those of you who have paid your exam fee uh, and the date that you need to pay your exam fee is Friday the 28th of October 3 p.m. South African time. You need to send your proof of payment to training at wpcua.co.za. I will not have time or capacity to reply to all the proof of payments that I receive, but I thank you in advance for all of those who will be paying, and I thank you now for all of you who have already paid. What I will do next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday night, is I will publish a list to everybody on my mailing list of all the email addresses that have been paid for to attempt the exam, okay? So if I have proofs of payment for a hundred candidates by Monday night next week, I will list all of those hundred email addresses and you can expect an exam link email next week, Saturday. Uh, between Monday and Wednesday, I'm sure I'll get more proofs of payment and I will on Wednesday night add to that list from Monday night and publish another list of hopefully 150 candidates who have paid for the exam. And then on Friday night, I will publish a last list of everyone who has paid or been paid for the exam. And I'm only going to list email addresses uh, in alphabetical order. I'm not going to be listing names. And so very important that you all attend Monday night's lecture because the registration process for the exam is somewhat tricky. Uh, there's a few things that you need to do um, that will help you to register correctly and show you how to start answering questions. What we will also go through is we will go through the Cricket South Africa introduction to umpiring exam also online. It's only 35 questions and it is a maximum of 30 minutes. So that demonstration will show you exactly how you will answer questions for the level one exam. It's just a shorter exam. And so we will go through the process from start to finish and you will see exactly how it works. You will also see that once you pass, the certificate will be emailed not to you, but to training at wpcua.co.za and then I will forward you your certificate when I get the chance. OK, so thank you very much for your attendance this evening. We shall wrap it all up uh, next week, Monday, with the revision lecture. Looking forward to that. Another very interactive session this evening, and I thank you. That's how we all learn. We shall reconvene on Monday evening, 1830 South African time. Have a great weekend when it comes. Thank you and good night. Good night. Thank you very much.
Good night, everyone. Have a good evening. Good night, everyone.